effects, right, of a bacteria, even the nucleic acid um, of a bacteria, right? So those are kind of the major groups. Within each of those groups, you have individual antibiotics, right? And um, if you'd go back a couple slides, you'd see the chart of the most commonly prescribed antibiotics in the United States, okay? Um, and so this is one of the most commonly prescribed antibiotics, right, cefalexin. Uh, it's part of the cephalosporin family. If you kind of look at it, it is also a beta-lactam uh, antibiotic. All right. So if it's a beta-lactam antibiotic, what is it inhibiting or what is it interfering with? Cell wall, right? Cell wall synthesis, cell wall construction, right? Um, perfect. And you can see here, right, it's resistant to beta-lactamase because of its structure. Remember, if we talk about sort of beta-lactam antibiotics, Sometimes you can give beta-lactamase inhibitors uh, with them, right? So that's a natural defense that some bacteria have is they have enzymes, right? That's one of the ways they can be resistant to antibiotics is they have enzymes that neutralize the antibiotic. And so this kind of, this group of antibiotics is really nice because its physical structure actually makes it hard for the enzyme beta-lactamase to interact uh, with the antibiotic, okay? So again, some of you may have had these if you've had a UTI um, any type of respiratory tract infection. All right, so this again, really, really common. So when you look at um, the things that are affected by this antibiotic, it makes sense, or the things that can be treated by this antibiotic, it makes sense that this is commonly prescribed, right? Because these are not uncommon problems, right? To have UTIs, to have, uh, well, bone infections are maybe a little more uncommon, but right, to have a skin infection or an ear infection, right, is not, is not uncommon at all. Ajax, anything in the chat? Okay. Go, go ahead, Blair. Yeah, it'd be yeah, it'd be like some type of um, STI. Mm -hmm. Good, Ajax. Okay. Okay. All right. So again, this is what we've we've talked about, right? Beta lactam antibiotics, and so. What I kind of like about this is it, it shows you, right, that you can have different structures here, right, that have that common beta-lactam ring. And so the side chains that are coming off of that beta-lactam ring are going to confer different um, capabilities, right, or the ability to interact with different bacteria based on your kind of side chain that you have there, all right? And so, um, one of the things we haven't really talked about too much, but NAM, right? Don't worry about that. We'll talk about that later. But NAM is basically a sugar. And so the cell wall of bacteria is basically a modified sugar coat, all right? And you have another molecule called NAG that's important in the peptidoglycan cell wall. But NAM, right, you link those together as part of the cell wall, and this interferes. Beta-lactam antibiotics interfere with that linkage, right? So you can't build a proper cell wall. And so um, what you do see here, right, is that you do have uh, penicillin binding uh, proteins that can be, again, produced um, by bacteria, right? And these are, again, really great at interfering um, with uh, beta-lactam antibiotics. And different bacteria can produce different varieties of penicillin binding um, proteins. All right. And so, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to take that back. Penicillin binding proteins, you can see there, catalyze the formation of peptide bridges between NAM molecules. And so, this is one of the targets, right, of beta lactam antibiotics. So, I got that mixed up, is the penicillin binding proteins. All right. So, that's what you want to try to target. All right. Yep. Yeah, so NAM is a, is a type of sugar. It's N-acetylmuramaric acid something. It's basically, it's a, it's a sugar. It's a sugar. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the peptidoglycan, the cell wall of the bacteria, um, is basically made up of sugar mo molecules that you uh, adhere to one another and then stack on top of one another. 
Okay. Um, so, you know, we've already talked about this, but this is, you know, you could look at this as a, as a potential weakness of beta-lactam antibiotics, right? Um, but the bacteria need to be dividing, right? If you're interfering with cell wall synthesis, you need the bacteria to be making a cell wall. So you need them to be dividing. So this is where, right, you would not want to give a bacteriostatic drug along with a beta-lactam drug, right? Because what, would it, what does a bacteriostatic antibiotic do? Right, it just stops it from growing, right? It arrests or inhibits cell synthesis, all right, or cell replication. And so if you gave those two drugs at the same time, the beta-lactam antibiotic wouldn't work because the cell's not dividing. So it almost like to be kind of canceling each other out, all right? So again, I, I already mentioned, but penicillin binding proteins differ among different bacteria, right? Which means you might have to have different drugs to try to target those proteins. Um, we already, you know, kind of mentioned in this case that some bacteria can synthesize beta-lactamase, right? So it's a natural protective mechanism that can make them resistant. And so again, you can give, um, you know, inhibitors of those enzymes along with the antibiotic to make them more effective, right? So you're trying to interfere with the bacteria's ability to be resistant, right? Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, I think, right, penicillin, the original kind of beta-lactam antibiotic was great at targeting gram-positive, but now because of these modifications, we can target gram-positive and uh, gram-negative. This I'm not expecting you to memorize, but what I, I just like this chart because it shows you different beta-lactam antibiotics. And so basically it's showing you, hey, when I change the side chain coming off of this beta-lactam ring, these are the different targets that I can then, all right, hit using the different antibiotics. So just kind of trying to emphasize to you, if you change the side chain, you change the activity of the antibiotic, all right? So just because it's a beta-lactam antibiotic does not mean it's only going after gram positive, right? That's not the case um, at all. Changing that side chain allows that antibiotic to work against different bacteria. Yes, ma'am. Well, you don't, you want to, you don't want to give it a bacteriostatic drug because if the bacteria doesn't divide, then the beta-lactam antibiotic can't interfere with cell wall synthesis. Does that make sense? Well, I know it makes sense to you, but we'll see if it makes sense um, to them. So just uh, a kind of a, a, another um, inhibitor of cell wall synthesis that I think is, is really cool, and you have it so it's down here on yours, right? Baxitracin. And basically what, what this does, and what's really cool uh, about bacteria, I think what's cool about bacteria, because of their cell walls, they have to, they can't, they can't really do endocytosis and exocytosis, right? And so those of you from previous biology classes, hopefully remember that endocytosis and exocytosis basically is where you're either kind of wrapping your membrane around a large object and you're bringing it into the cell, or if it's leaving, right, it kind of fuses with the membrane and then you pinch off a piece of your membrane when you send it away, right? Bacteria can't really do that because of their cell wall. And so they are heavily, heavily dependent upon um, protein channels, right? Channels made out of protein to move things in and out of their cells. And so what baxitracin does is it actually interferes, right, with the transport of these NAGNAM, right, these sugar molecules that are going to be put together to make the cell wall. It interferes with their transport across the cell membrane. So these sugar molecules are assembled, right, or put together inside the cytoplasm of the bacteria, and then they're transported out. So what baxitracin does is it actually interferes with that transport out, right? So you can't even get the building materials, right? It'd be like if you were super rich, right? And you had a, uh, a house on a little island and you had a bridge that got to that little island, right? And a storm came and destroyed the bridge while you were trying to build the house. Well, even though you have all the material to build it, 
you can't get it to its target. And that's what's happening here with baxitracin, all right? It's, mm -hmm. So those little, those little blue, see the blue purple, right? Those are nag and nam molecules. And so what would happen is you transport those across and then you link them together and that would build your cell wall. And so you're just preventing them from even getting over. You have nothing to link or put together. You can't make a cell wall. Okay. Both. So we've talked about, so all beta lactam antibiotics are going to interfere with cell wall synthesis. All right. But some beta lactam antibiotics are going to have the ability to affect gram positive and gram negative bacteria differently based on their side chain. Some of them are also going to be different in their ability to resist things like beta lactam ACE. Okay. Um, so the next most commonly prescribed antibiotic, right, is azithromycin, which some of you may have had. Again, if you go down here uh, and look, right, if any of you had pneumonia, bronchitis, hopefully not any uh, STIs, but if you've had an ear infection, sinus infection, this is a really commonly prescribed antibiotic. It's also really nice, right, because it's targeting, right, the 70S ribosome. Why is this um, an antibiotic that a doctor may prescribe if they're pretty sure you have a bacterial infection, but they have no idea what you have? Why would this be good? Abby? So it's true, we don't have a 70S. Yes. So actually, we haven't really talked about this. The math, just trust me on this. So ribosomes are made of two major subunits that are also made of smaller subunits. But you, for bacteria, they have a 50S and they have a 30S. And when you combine those, it makes a 70S, okay? For us, we have a 60 and a 40 and it combines to make an 80. Now, the... <laughs> The numbers are not the basic math. The S is basically for sedimentation rate or sedimentation time. And so if you centrifuge these, if you spin them really, really fast, that measurement, that 50S, 70S, 30S, 60S, 40S, whatever you want to say, is the time that it takes for that unit to go to the bottom of a tube. All right. Um, so that's why you can take a, a 50 and a 30 and they sediment down at a 70, right? So I promise I'm not that bad at math, right? It, it's, it's, not, it's not just a simple math. All right, so, but that's, I mean, Abby's right. So this is a good target because we don't have a, uh, a 70 S, right? Except where? Where do we have one, Jada? Your mitochondria, okay, good. All right, shoot. Right, it's a, it's a nice general target. And if you go back to talking about beta-lactam antibiotics, right, um, you know, for the most part, sometimes it typically is harder to get a beta-lactam antibiotic to be effective against a gram-negative. I mean, we do have some, right, but still the easiest target for them, if they're interfering with cell wall synthesis, is a gram-positive bacteria because it has a much bigger cell wall. And so in this case, azithromycin, does anyone know what's the, what's the common name of azithromycin? Yeah, what's the, when you go to the doctor, they give you a what? z, -Pak. z -Pak, right, perfect, right? So a lot of you have probably, um, probably had this. And it's a really good antibiotic too, because you know it's like the z -Pak, gosh, I can't remember what the dosing schedule is. It's like you take, right, and you can do like, you do a couple pills, like th I think up front, and then it gets spread out. And so it's a pretty like, there we go. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, I haven't, I had one maybe like a year ago. Um, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of always torn about Z-Packs. I feel like uh, doctors kind of pass them out like they're candy sometimes, a little bit too much, but they also are highly effective. Um, you know, so I have an answer. So why are they even, why are they even with COVID? Is there some hydroxychloroquine and stuff? They're using azithromycin with COVID. 
I'd have to look that up. I haven't, I haven't seen that. I just wonder if it's the interaction between the two. Well, <sighs> yeah, that's so tough too. What you, you know, and I haven't looked as much in, in COVID, right? So when you talk about the flu and I'm not saying that the, I'm, I'm not saying the flu is the same as COVID and I'm not saying one's worse or one, but like with a lot of times when people get the flu and they end up dying, they end up dying from getting pneumonia as complications from the flu, right? So in that case, sometimes if you actually have a really severe case of the flu, antibiotics can help because they can help you deal with the bacteria that might be causing pneumonia. I don't know if that's possibly um, what could be going on, but I have to look. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, send me the link. All right, I'll be waiting. As soon as I'm done with, as soon as I'm done with AMP one, I'm going to hit refresh every 30 minutes on my email. All right, um, I heard that. that's interesting. All right, um, so azithromycin falls into a group of drugs called the microlids, right? And um, what this group of drugs is doing, right, is they're interfering with protein synthesis. And what's cool, you can interfere with protein synthesis in a lot of different ways. You can interfere with the 50s subunit. You can interfere with the 30s subunit. You can interfere with transfer RNA, right? Bringing amino acids um, to uh, the ribosomes, right? So there's a lot of different the, what, things that you can do. Um, these are, are nice too. Um, can you talk about pneumonia and bronchitis? Sometimes those are caused by mycobacteria, right? We haven't really talked about it, but mycobacteria lack a cell wall. Um, and, you know, again, not to get in an evolution kind of debate with anybody, but mycobacterium, we think that they are kind of maybe the original bacteria, really simple kind of basic structure. And so something like a beta-lactam antibiotic has no effect on a bacteria that lacks a cell wall, right? And so azithromycin um, can, can target some of those, right? So it's kind of nice because, uh, you know, uh, Jada and Abby are right, right? Everything has a 70S. You don't really have a 70S with the exception of your mitochondria, so you can stand a pretty high dose um, of this drug. Okay. So when we talk about inhibiting protein synthesis in general, this can be bactericidal or, right, bacteriostatic. And so if you interfere with an enzyme that's needed for replication, potentially, all right, um, well, then the cell might still be alive. You're just not, you're no longer dividing, right? But you can also see a scenario where if you're interfering with protein synthesis, you could potentially lead to the death of that bacteria, right? If it can't make um, proteins, okay? So again, you guys already pointed this out, right? 70S ribosomes, great target um, because we don't have one with the exception of mitochondria, so it can eventually have toxic effects. And then again, you can see here, right? I mentioned these, interfere with translation, right? Uh, or stop the initiation of translation, so it can't even start, so you get to transcription and you can't go any farther, all right? Um, you can prevent the continuation of translation once it's started, and as I mentioned before, you can interfere with transfer RNA, and remember, transfer RNA is what's bringing amino acids to the ribosome as you're assembling a polypeptide that will eventually probably grow into a protein. Uh, I wouldn't say it's the most effective um, type of drug. It's, it's nice because it does cover a broad range, but like anything else, um, bacteria have become resistant, you know, to it. So, you know, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's tough to say what's more effective or, or, or what's not. It is a very effective drug if there's not resistance but it certainly is not, um, it's not so good that bacteria can't develop resistance to it, if that makes sense. All right, so again, this is just showing you, all right, some of the different um, antibiotics, right? So azithromycin, right, would fall into that microlids, um, or macrolids uh, category, but you can see, and I kind of like this diagram from your, uh, of the textbook that I used to use is it just kind of tells you, hey, this drug targets the 50s, this drug targets the 30s. Again, both unique, right, with the exception of mitochondria, right, to bacteria that you don't see 
in your cells, right? So you'd have a 60S and you'd have a 40S, all right? We'll talk about a little bit later too, ribosomes uh, and their RNA is actually what we use now for phylogenetic classification of bacteria. It's a really effective way um, to identify them. Okay. So again, I'm not going to um, ask you to memorize these different drugs, but I do want you to know that you can interfere with the 30S, you can interfere, interfere with the 50S, you can prevent the initiation of translation, you can interrupt translation, and then you can interrupt transfer RNA, bringing amino acids to the ribosome. Okay. Um, and if, if none of that makes any sense to you, um, I have to double check. Let me know. I'd have to double check where it is in this new textbook, but it might be worth your while if you need to just review the basics of transcription and translation uh, as it pertains to protein synthesis. Okay. So, um, so basically what's happening here, right, is this is mRNA, right, and it's being fed through the ribosome, right, and I don't know if you remember this from uh, AMP a little bit or your PA, so you have to do bio one and bio two, right, so we may have, I can't remember if we, if we talk about it in there, but remember every three nucleotides forms what? A codon, right, so remember you have the codon, which is three nucleotides, uh, on the end of transfer RNA, you have the anticodon, right? And then on the other end of it, you have your amino acid attached. And so the transfer RNA matches up with the codon, and that's how you know what amino acid to bring in. And so basically, if you interfere with the transfer RNA, you um, aren't allowing uh, those amino acids to come in and be added. Does that, does that help? Okay, perfect. Ooh, okay, so this is one of the few metabolic um, interfering antibiotics. Can someone remind me? I know we had mentioned this, but why don't we have a lot of drugs in this category? Right, we have a lot of similar metabolic pathways. And so, you know, it's just if you, again, if you start to interfere with a lot of their metabolic pathways, you start to interfere with a lot of our metabolic pathways. And then, right, your therapeutic index, right, is not nearly as good, right, because now you're having more of an effect on the host. All right. Uh, so here, right, uh, sulfa, methoxol, and trinthoprim, right, are given in combination. And basically what you can see here is there's two points that they, they kind of interfere, all right? So your sulfa drugs and your trimethoprim, you give both of them. Again, it's nice to give both of them because it kind of helps prevent resistance uh, in this pathway. And basically, all right, what it doesn't show here very well um, is that it's interfering with folic acid synthesis is one of the things um, that it does, right? These drugs do. And when you interfere with these pathways, all right, Basically, what you're interfering with uh, is the ability to make nucleotides, all right? So if you interfere with their ability to make nucleotides, you interfere with their ability um, to replicate, right? So you're targeting a couple enzymes with these drugs in them, prevents nucleotide formation, no nucleotides, no replication. Could that, because it affects folic acid, could that affect, like, birds? Yeah, so, I, so Blair, that's a great question. I... I, I would assume, but again, um, Abby's maybe the closest person to this, right? When it comes to pharmacy school, they'll teach you this stuff. I would assume that, you know, a doctor would not prescribe something that inhibits folic acid synthesis um, to a pregnant woman. Now, again, right? This is kind of trying to target a unique pathway, so I don't know how much it would interfere with folic acid in us. Presumably, my guess would be they would probably try to avoid this if a, if a woman was pregnant, right? And what, what, what increases or what risk increases if a woman is not uh, synthesizing or has enough folic acid in her system? Mm -mm. Nope. Trisomy, unfortunately, well, fortunately, unfortunately, doesn't have anything to do there because trisomy, the, the, the chromosomes have already kind of split over right before. What is it? It doesn't close, and what does that cause? Yeah. 
So it's, it causes something called spina bifida. And so where the neural tube doesn't close is actually at the base um, of the spine. The levels of severity can, can, can vary quite drastically. And so actually one of the things that if any of you choose to have a child or get married and then the person you married has a child, right? Because it's a challenging for three of you couldn't have babies, sorry. You know, that's just the way the cookies crumble. But uh, so one of the, things, the first things they'll do is they'll, they'll check along the baby's back after it's born to make sure that, that things have closed up down there. All right. Oh, yeah, okay. So here we go. So uh, the next kind of, right, or one of the other groups, right, is new, interfering with nucleic acid uh, uh, synthesis, all right? interfering with replication. And so here you have, right, uh, fluoroquinones, right? And so you can see uh, topoisomerases, right? Uh, if you guys remember from replication, one of the big things that has to happen uh, in order for you to replicate DNA is you have to unwind it, right? Uh, DNA in bacteria and in us is tightly wound. In order to get access to it, things need to be uh, unwound, all right? And so if you can't unwind DNA, well, then you can't, you can't replicate it, all right? I mean, pretty, pretty basic um, there. Um, and again, hopefully none of you have had anthrax or the plague or infectious diarrhea or typhoid fever, right? Um, it, yeah, if you're getting prescribed a fluoroquinone, right, this is a, I would consider it a relatively serious um, infection. Now, it could be possible to get some of these, uh, depending on, on you know, what area of, of the world um, you've been, but I would say n not uh, as commonly prescribed here in the United States, right? Um, again, uh, rifamycins, right, interfere with RNA polymerase. If you interfere with RNA polymerase, what, do you, what are you preventing? Transcription, right? Replication, transcription, translation. So you're preventing uh, transcription. Um, again, whew, tuberculosis, leprosy, meningitis. All right, um, you know, not, not good, but you know, one of the things that's nice, again, is tuberculosis, leprosy. Um, I have to look up Neisseria meningitis. I'm not sure as much about it, um, but unique bacteria that are lacking cell walls. So again, a, a, another kind of good drug to target because if you give them a, a beta lactam, it's just not going to do anything um, for them. All right, metrodiazole. Um, if any of you have inflammatory bowel disease, right, either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, or if you know somebody that has inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, this is one of the antibiotics that's commonly prescribed um, to these patients. Uh, it's really interesting because it actually targets nucleic acid uh, synthesis slash replication in anaerobic um, bacteria. All right. Uh, and so it's going to um, be much more effective on bacteria that are, that are in the gut, right? Because uh, the farther you go down the digestive tract, right, the less oxygen uh, you get, all right? Uh, its common name is flagell. I think that's kind of fun, but that's just me. Um, it can also be used, right, for bacterial vaginosis, uh, STIs, right, inflammatory bowel disease, and Clostridium difficile. Interestingly enough, too, this drug, uh, when taken in conjunction with alcohol, uh, induces projectile vomiting. And so uh, for people that are alcoholics, uh, sometimes doctors will prescribe this to them to try to help them uh, kick uh, their addiction uh, a little bit, right? Because I think we've all been there before you get sick. The last thing that you've eaten is probably something you don't eat for a long time afterwards, right? And so the same kind of general principles used for this drug, interestingly enough. Ooh, here's another good one. And I think you guys already know the answer, right? So again, if we're talking about interfering with a cell membrane, why are there so few drugs? Because we have a cell membrane, right? 
and and there are differences and, and we'll point out some of those differences a little bit later in the in the semester but for the most part the composition of your cell membrane is very similar to the composition of the cell membrane of bacteria and so taking a drug that interferes with cell that interferes or disrupts the cell membrane is going to have a lot of negative effects potentially on you as well all right so daptomycin and polymyxins um, polymyxin you can see here if any of you have had antibiotic eye drops uh, this is one of the most common uh, antibiotics that is used uh, in an eye drop okay so you've you maybe uh, had this before if you've had pink eye and they think it's bacterial then you've probably had an eye drop with polymyxin um, B all right so it's going to interfere um, with the uh, membrane right or in this case the outer membrane right of a gram negative bacteria remember they have that extra layer okay. um, and daptomycin you can see here inserts into the cytoplasmic membrane so it wedges its way in right which disrupts the membrane and this can be done in blood and skin infections. Skin infections hopefully makes a lot of sense to you because if it's a skin infection, um, then it's gonna be topical and so it's not gonna have a systemic effect um, like an oral antibiotic. Yeah. Abby, after you graduate pharmacy school successfully, you can come back and teach the antibiotic unit. Okay, deal? Deal. All right, so we talked about antibiotic resistance um, a little bit, right, as far as finishing your, your prescriptions. Please also note, right, um, watch that, that one video that I have posted uh, in this section. And, and again, we, we've talked about this too, right? How do they become resistant? Well, they have genes that allow them to make efflux pumps, right? So basically, this was the example of if I poked a hole, I think I had Hannah in the boat, right? I poked a hole in it and water came in, but I gave her a bucket so she could bail it out. So water's coming in to try to sink her, right? To try to sink her boat, but then she can bail it out, right? And she kind of keeps things even. So an efflux pump, as soon as a drug enters, it gets pumped back out, right? We talked about in gram-negative bacteria, they have that extra membrane. And so in order to get things in and out of the cell, they have a big kind of group of proteins called porins, right? That form a pore that allow things in and out. These porons can be open or shut. So in the case, of the addition of a medication, right? They shut themselves up so that medication can't get to them, all right? We can also alter the target, right? So we change the shape or structure um, of something in the bacteria that the medication is trying to get to, all right? So I use an example when Taylor was in here, right? She had a red sweater on and my drug targets red sweaters. So what does she do? She puts on a coat and she's still her, but she looks slightly different. So now my drug can't interact with her, right? And then we talked about beta lactamase. So you have an enzyme that can neutralize the drug. All right, does that make, does that make sense? So these are gonna be the basic mechanisms. Now we'll talk about it probably next unit, right? What gets scary is if you go back here, a little bit what we're not really showing right is that um, bacteria have the awesome ability uh, to undergo something called horizontal gene transfer and we'll talk about this in more detail later but basically horizontal gene transfer uh, is referring to three main mechanisms that bacteria have to share genetic information so if morgan has information that allows her to be resistant to a bacteria or resistant to an antibiotic she could easily share that information with rachel who can then share it with Jenna, who can then share it with Jada, right? And so there's just a lot of different kind of unique uh, things that are awesome from a biological, pathological perspective, but that give us um, a lot of trouble, right? And what we used to think too at one point is like E. coli could only share information with E. coli or bacillus could only share information with us. And so we now, right, are, are discovering and finding out that different species of bacteria actually have the ability to share different genes with one another, right? Making antibiotic resistance uh, even more uh, troublesome and more efficient from the bacterial perspective. All right, so this is just showing you some horizontal gene transfer um, a little bit here. This is, I guess, a little bit of a, a public health kind of notice. Um, so 
you know, one of the most effective ways to change or fight antibiotic resistance is actually through patient doctor accountability and education. All right. Um, you know, I, th I think I would argue that we're actually seeing positive effects from public health, right? So public health, you think about uh, social distancing, right? Stay your six feet away, wear your mask, right? This is not, um, I, would, I would say not hardcore sacrifices, even though I guess there are some Americans that would disagree with me. And if you're one of them, I'm, I'm fine with that, right? Um, but, you know, I feel relatively comfortable saying if we weren't doing social distancing, if we weren't wearing masks, right? We'd have even more people that were being infected or affected um, by the virus. And so we see that kind of same or similar principles applied um, to antibiotic resistance, right? Basically trying to educate. And so what you can see here, right? This is from the CDC. And do I have on here when this data is from? I can't see there. Okay. Oh, this is like 20, okay. This is 2012 data, but they posted this in 2016, right? Not, I wouldn't say it's really a problem, but when you have large data sets, right, that you collect over a period of years, right, it, 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 it's always kind of lagging behind a little bit, right? Um, I assume that we're not going to make this goal, um, but the CDC, right, wants to reduce antibiotic uh, use in outpatients by 50%. And what you can see here is that of the antibiotics that are prescribed, right, across all levels, uh, that 70%, right, are necessary, 30% are unnecessary. So what, what do you think, what's a major driving factor in the prescription of unnecessary antibiotics? What do you think? Right, I mean, that's one of the BS. So you come in, your kid's miserable, and, you know, they do whatever, whatever, or maybe they don't even test that much and they're just like, we'll just give them an antibiotic. All right, so that's definitely um, a problem. What virus do you think has been attributed to probably the most steady increase in antibiotic resistance? What would you guess? The flu, all right? So a similar kind of principle, you come in, you know, I'm miserable, I'm miserable. And so this is where it gets interesting, right? One of the things, and I'll talk about this uh, in the one video, but one of the things I want you guys to be thinking about is, you know, how, how do you prevent antibiotic resistance from kind of a public health standpoint, right? And it gets interesting because as someone with a little kid, I certainly don't fault someone going into the doctor with a kid and being like, I want medicine to make my kid better, right? Um, uh, we can talk about that in a second, but I definitely think that, you know, doctors need to kind of, or PAs or nurse practitioners, right, need to kind of hold to their, hold their ground and be like, you know, I'm sorry, this is viral. Like I'm not, there's nothing that we can do other than treat symptoms and wait it out. Um, so at my, my daughter's pediatrician, the first thing they do, right, is they do um, basically a whole blood count, right, where they can see um, the different white blood cells, right? And so if you have neutrophils, uh, for instance, are really highly elevated, that's indi indicative of a bacterial infection, right? If you have T cells and B cell numbers that are kind of crazy or all over the place, sometimes high, sometimes low, some viruses can actually knock down the number of uh, B cells or T cells, or you can see an increase in them. So it's kind of interesting. If they saw that, then they're not going to give you an antibiotic, right? So that's, that's good practice, right? What we also see, again, I think I mentioned this is like after surgeries, and I'm not saying this is bad, but a doctor's like, well, I just want to prescribe a bunch of antibiotics just to make sure, all right? And so, right, there's a big push, again, to try to kind of control those numbers. And so there's responsibility from a parent standpoint or from a patient standpoint, right, that no matter, you know, how bad you feel, if it's not bacterial, then demanding and screaming for an antibiotic is not going to help you, right? Another thing, I don't know if I have it. Uh, on here. I don't think I do is that, you know, a lot of times in third world countries, it's a lot easier to get antibiotics. And so they're not as tightly regulated. And so if they're not as tightly regulated, they're easy to get people take them for things they shouldn't take them for. And then we increase resistance. Um, this is showing you um, antibiotic prescriptions per 1000, right? Uh, uh, in each state. And so 
you know, presumably, you know, if you look at like Tennessee, which is in the darkest category here, that means that basically there's enough antibiotics prescribed in the state of Tennessee, right, in 2015 that every single person in the state actually was prescribed a little over one antibiotic prescription, right? Now, that's not necessarily true, but what that means is that, you know, some people, right, I'll pick on Jennifer Buckner, maybe she got five antibiotics prescribed in 2015. I'm not saying that that's true, but right, when you average out, that's still kind of a, kind of a little bit of an alarming number, right, that every single, there's so much antibiotics prescribed in the state of Tennessee that there's enough prescribed for every single person. Um, again, probably not shocking to you guys if you've seen any heat maps <laughs> for metabolic disease, for obesity, for cardiovascular disease, for kidney stones, for strokes, um, all that stuff, right? The Southeast is number one, right? And we're also number one in antibiotics, right? Is that any um, my guess would be yes, but I haven't, I haven't dug too, too much more into that data. The last thing here before I'll, I'll let you go um, is this is just showing, and, and this, is not, this is not shocking, I don't think, but it's showing who's prescribing the most antibiotics, right? And so you see primary care physicians, PAs, right? Nurse practitioners, those are number one and number two. Not shocking, right? Because that's where you're going for most of your checkups. Um, the one that I thought was interesting um, is that uh, dentists actually make it into the top four, which I didn't, I didn't know that. Like I've never had, um, I guess thankfully never had my dentist prescribe um, antibiotics. Now, sometimes, you know, dentists have to prescribe antibiotics because depending on what bacterial infection you have in your mouth, um, when you start poking around in there, uh, you open up their bloodstream uh, to bacteria, which can then go to their heart. But it's still, it's, it's, you know, it's just really interesting. You have dermatologists, OBGYNs, and a bunch of others, right? And so, you know, definitely kind of up here is, is where there's probably the most work to be done. I don't want we don't want people to not get their medication, but can we be more responsible in how we distribute medication? Yes, ma'am. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's one of the big things too. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that, but I, I kind of, I indicated I think on Wednesday with, uh, with Michael or maybe even on Monday, right? That, no, on Monday, because we didn't even really talk on Wednesday. Yeah, so on Monday. So yeah, so that, that's, that is probably one of the primary causes of antibiotic resistance, right, is not finishing medications. Again, oh, I feel better, so now I can stop. And again, remember, you initially feel better because the majority of the bacteria in your body are probably susceptible. And so that initial dose or a couple doses of medication wipes them out easily. But then you're left with a few bacteria that maybe need to be hit a little harder over the head and if you stop your medication they divide and then you have a bunch of bacteria that need to be hit hard over the head and your antibiotic is no longer as effective on them uh, and it might not be effective at all yeah so definitely definitely a huge issue right so that's where we're going to stop we'll pick up with uh hopefully try to get through ugh, viruses and fungi next week uh, but we'll see how that goes I may, and again, I'm going to think about this this weekend, I may push the exam back so we can get a little more material in. Is that what you want? No, you don't want to, you want it on a Friday? Okay. Okay, well then I'm going to stick to my guns. We're going to do it on Friday, All right? But I'm going to talk super, super fast. Yeah, no, I won't talk super fast, but I'm listening. Listen, listen, really what know. do you hear? That's from Simple Songs that my I'm daughter listens to. to this okay. It's With Z-Pack? Yes. The Z-Pack? Okay, okay. I'm just curious because I also saw something that said coronavirus is a bacterial infection, which I don't think that that's the case, but. I mean, that'd be weird because I'm like, they've isolated the